Welcome to the Kid Lit Club with Sally Rippon and Adrian Beck. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Kid Lit Club. Here's Sally Rippon. Here's Adrian Beck. <laughs> we are your hosts with the mosts and we're going to take you through the world of Kid Lit uh, this episode. And look, we've got some exciting stuff on this episode, so I'm going to get straight to it. The Rippon Report <laughs> is back. By popular demand, we've had an onslaught of comments Barrage, and feedback. Just like a, yeah. Just My computer avalanche. started smoking. It was getting so much <laughs> feedback about the first Rip and Report. Now you're sounding sarcastic. <laughs> no, not at all. I'm looking forward to another Rip and Report. We've got that coming up. And as everyone knows by now, you're not quite sure what the Rip and Report's about until we get there. So uh, stay tuned because this one is a beauty. Um, and also, we're going to be talking about Joanne Harris in mm. our um, social media watch segment. She's put out she puts out lots of ten tweets. Yeah, series I of ten look her tweets. Up. I didn't know that. Although yeah. I'm not on Twitter, so yeah, mm, I miss out on a whole world yeah. of things. You I do. Yeah. She, of course, wrote the chocolate series. Chocolat. Oh, chocolat. My <laughs> mistake. <laughs> we were practicing off camera. We decided not to go. Oh, I got it that. wrong. Yeah. Um, and also, um, we are going to be speaking to Felice Arena, yes. who is, of course, such a massive uh, name in Kid Lit and yeah. did Specky McGee for all those years, but now he's moved into historical fiction. Yeah. Um, he's and very he's done, diverse, his writing he's, style. He is, isn't yeah. he? He's a diverse yeah. sort of fellow. Yeah. So we'll, we'll delve a bit further into Felice's diverseness. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure that's a word. Well, he comes from television too, I think. He does, he, yes. Yeah, think well, he, he comes from theatre and then right. a bit of TV as well. Yeah. So And then children's books, but he does some really... Um, I think his, the first children's novel I read of his was quite deep and heartfelt and then yep. he does kind of funny slapsticky yep. ones. and does yes. it all. Yeah. It's a triple he illustrates threat. too. He does illustrate yeah. too. He's done some amazing, amazing. illustrations on yeah. his Instagram too. Right. Which look pretty cool. Yeah. Anyway, we'll get to him later because it is almost the footy season. In fact, it's the start of the footy season. My favourite time of year. You would be pumped about this, Sally. I, I know you're love like. it when punt road is blocked. It's my favourite time of year. Who do you barrack for, by the way? Oh. <laughs> barrack. Uh, that's like the team you follow, isn't yeah, that's it? Right. <laughs> Not my media. Uh, no. She I likes them all. Punt road clearing up <laughs> the season. She likes it. Don't make her choose. She likes them all. That's right. Um, I go for the underdog. Actually, the year that... Um, Western Bulldogs were yes. playing. That was kind of exciting because of the whole underdog. Thing. Everyone sort of felt like they won yeah. that year, I reckon. Yeah. It was so long uh, in between drinks for Western Bulldogs. So yeah. that was awesome. Okay, but footy season is upon us. So I wanted to talk to you really briefly about uh, sporty books. Yes, my forte. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of sporty books around. In fact, um, as we mentioned earlier, Fleet Show Arena did Specky McGee, yeah. which pretty much kicked off the whole genre yeah, in this true. country for true. sporty books. But there's a heap of sporty books around at the moment. I've written some sporty books mm. too. Um, and what I love about sporty books is the fact that sometimes they can reach kids that perhaps aren't really necessarily all that bookish. Yeah, I think that's really important. And, yeah. you know, I think that's where you engage. A lot of people will say they struggle getting boys to read. And even yep. though it's a cliche, you know, that, that is often an area where... They, they can be interested in um, potentially non-fiction or books about things they're into as yep. well, which could be sports. So um, you've done some beautiful work for those reaching, you know, a really wide range of kids. Yeah, well, that th that's the plan. Uh, lots of action, lots mm. of um, lots of uh, gags and jokes and silly things all the way through it. So uh, Champion Charlie's last year was a soccer book, which yep. was a lot of fun. But pretty much, I like I like the sporty books because they they do reach those kids. Uh, this is obviously very generalised and broadly speaking, but they yeah. do reach those kids that um, perhaps are not all that bookish and love to get around and kick the ball around and um, swing the bat around and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So you're sort of tapping into their, um, uh, what they love uh, more so than perhaps reading. Um, and then you could look at it on the other side of the coin, whereby you are writing some books for kids that are perhaps more bookish but maybe they could benefit from, you know, getting outside and doing a bit of exercise. Getting a bit of fresh air. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Playing on a team and all that sort of stuff. So you kind of, I like to think that you're kind of reaching both sides uh, there with the, with the sporty books. I've got a friend who says there's two types of people in the world. Yes. People who need to read more and people who need to get out more. I'm definitely <laughs> of the former. <laughs> 
I see. No, the latter. I need <laughs> so to get out more. I was thinking about that. <laughs> do you need to get out more or do you need to read more? No, both. Could you read that. more? <laughs> Could, is that possible? I can never read too much. I see. Yeah. But there was a really great series that I actually really enjoyed reading last year. It's just come to mind. It's The Play Like a Girl. So when... Yeah. Um, the, about Joe Stanley. Girls, yeah, Joe Stanley about yep. girls football. Because that was kind of exciting for me too, who's mm. not... You know, I don't really follow sport. I didn't grow up in Melbourne, so mm. football isn't really my history or mm. my culture. Um, but that's but it was a really exciting buzz when women started playing professional football. It was. And so to have that series yep. out for kids was really fun, and I really enjoyed reading that because yep. a lot of it's about teamwork, friendship, mm. um, and that's where I think you're right that kids that may not think they're into sport or adults that may not understand <laughs> sport can see that it, what it really yeah. stands for. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I remember that. Um, the very first AFLW game at Princess Park, and it right. was a sellout. Yeah. And people had to be turned away. It, it would was have been so amazing. popular. And imagine just... being a grandmother saying that I played in that first yeah. game, you know, t- telling your amazing, granddaughter that or something really lovely. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. great. Very special. So there is room for sporty books, and we love our sporty books, so uh, keep them coming. Anyway, now it's time for The Rippin' Report. And on this edition, Sally chats with graphic novelist Hannah Potter about her favourite graphic novels and what inspires her. So Hannah and I met when Hannah was still at University High School Mm -hmm. and I used to do a program there uh, talking to students about picture book workshops and Hannah was in one of my classes and she handed in this most incredible graphic novel. Oh, stop it. No, seriously. (laughs) And as soon as I went into the library and the librarian handed this over, I said, I've got to meet this girl. This is the most (laughs) astonishing work. It was completely like nothing I'd ever seen before. And this is year eight, so what were you like about? I, was, I would have been like 13. 13. 13. And then we got the chance to meet again when you did your 10 work mm-hmm. experience, yep. which is a few years ago now. Yeah. But yeah. one of the reasons why I think it's important to talk about this is that I certainly really struggled when I was a teenager to be taken seriously in my want to pursue art. Mm. Fortunately, um, I had some really great art teachers that really encouraged me to keep on going with it, but it was never considered a real option. Unless you do like graphic design or something, but yeah. if like, you want to do illustration or just be an artist, that's kind of like, oh, I don't know about that. You yeah. Know? Hannah has just kept on working, which to me, I think is really exciting because it means that it's obviously what you're going to do. You mm-hmm. love it. You're passionate about it. And Hannah has gone on to create more and more work, many graphic novels. Mm-hmm. One in particular you've been working on for maybe a year. It took a year and a half, yeah. Yeah, a year and a half. Ah. That's the kind of commitment <laughs> it takes to put a graphic novel together. Yes. <laughs> so tell me a little bit then, you've been working on this for such a long time. What mm-hmm. is it that, do you mind if I ask you how old you are? Is that embarrassing? No, that's not embarrassing. 20. She's 20. I'm okay, 20. so when I first <laughs> met you, maybe 14 or something like yes, that. So we have known each other for a while. Mm-hmm. So why... What is it that keeps you going? Because can I just show yes, the audience course, this? Course, I'm just going to just show the pile of paper. Okay. The pile of paper. This has a, at least one drawing on every page. Yeah. Am it's I not right? double-sided. It's only single-sided. Okay. But still, yeah. seriously, guys. There's a the year work, and a half of my life right the there. The work that goes into something like this. And I'll show you a few close-ups later. Why? How can Why? you keep, yeah, that's what is the it question, that keeps you it? going <laughs> and persisting with something like that? Because that is commitment. Mm. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that in some ways I feel that it's kind of one of the few things I'm actually meant to do. I don't think, I think if I had any other job, I would be doing it anyways. Because when I don't do it, um, you know, I get depressed. Mm-hmm. and anxious like it's my way of actually like processing the world which is why it can the stuff that I do can sometimes be a little bit dark because I'm trying to like deal with things um, that I don't know how to deal with in real life mm. which I think is kind of what art does for most people um, so do you read a lot of graphic novels as well I do mm-hmm. yeah the first real graphic novel I read was Persepolis mm. um, I was about 10 yeah I was 10 um, you know, it's basically a woman talking about her childhood growing up in Iran during the revolution and um, and also Mouse. I read mm. Mouse when I was about 12. Uh, which, Spiegelman. Uh, Spiegelman. 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 Yeah. 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 Which, um, if you don't know, is... You should. Um, you should. You look it up. Yeah. You should. It's about um, a man interviewing his father who survived Auschwitz 
but the way that it's done is really, really just so visually affecting and it's not gratuitous in any way. Mm. Um, but I found those two books like particularly amazing because it was just so, I want to say raw. Um, and the way that the story was told was just, just beautiful. Um, and yeah, and especially I have favorites right now. I read Rosalie Lightning by Tom Hart recently, um, which was basically a man, his, his, um, this is going to sound really depressing. Like, all I do is read depressing books. Um, but we all have, you know, our taste. We have our things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but his infant daughter dies, and he basically wrote a book to deal with it. So mm. <laughs> I think in some ways that's what's amazing about art and especially graphic novels is that the reason that he actually is still alive is because he wrote a book mm -hmm. about everything that had happened to mm. him and what he was feeling and thinking about it. Um, well, I know certainly a couple of years ago, uh, um, maybe it was only last year when Nick Cave was touring again, I went to see him um, at the <laughs> My Music Bowl and it was soon after one of his twin boys had mm -hmm. died tragically. Yeah. And he certainly said it was the work that got him through, that it was keeping on um, channeling. It, it's almost like if you're having intense emotions, they can just be so overwhelming and you can be so lost in them unless you have... A, somewhere to put them and a, yeah. a way of understanding that we can all be connected by grief or we can be connected by love all of those things and it's almost like the intense emotion doesn't feel useless if you have somewhere to put it is that yeah. kind of how you yeah. work through that kind of stuff exactly yeah um because my, my book is about basically a teenage girl who has this weird family and she doesn't really have any sort of support structure in dealing with anything except like perhaps like some of her friends because her mom is this you know this dizzy kind of dramatic character and doesn't really know how to be there for anybody mm. so even for herself even really. for herself yeah. yeah it's pretty much a better version or a polished version of the book that you read when I met you even if it doesn't turn out that I can actually get it published by a publisher I'll just try to self-publish it yeah I'll try to get it out there somewhere yeah somehow fantastic. so we're gonna look out for it and if you <laughs> haven't explored the amazing world of graphic novels yet there's really graphic novels for absolutely so every many. type of person like Nikki Greenberg obviously has done a couple of fantastic graphic novels Sean Tan with the arrival um, we have some amazing graphic novelists here there's yeah. all kinds of styles um, young people, old people, um, you know, classics. Uh, and, you know, I th I'm really excited to see where we expand into graphic novels here in Australia. So I think we made a really good start and <laughs> hopefully there'll be much more. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Well, that was a ripping report. Another excellent instalment. Thank, Thank you, you so much. You were going to say ripping. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> I feel like I say that every time. I know. In fact, <laughs> The amount of journalists that I've had mm. who have headed an interview with me ripping yarns, <laughs> thinking that that's original, I feel like saying that you have no idea how many people have used that. But let's just keep riffing off it. Yeah? Okay. Riffing off in the ripping. I love it. It was a ripping, a ripping report, <laughs> and there'll be more to come in the coming uh, in the coming episodes. Okay, but now it's time for this. Social Media Watch. Social Media Watch, and uh, this, the. What we're watching this time around is Joanne Harris. Mm. Now, as you said uh, earlier, Sal, she of course was most famous for probably writing chocolate. Yeah, chocolat. Oh, chocolate. <laughs> My mistake again. <laughs> uh, but what, what I find interesting, and this is uh, on her Twitter account, Joanne often uh, puts out a series of tweets which she calls hashtag 10 tweets, and mm. they'll be about writing and, well, it could be, well, mainly about the publishing industry, all sorts of different things, really. Um, and people interact and people retweet and, and all this sort of stuff, and it, and it drives quite a bit of a bit of a buzz. Um, and on International Children's Book Day last year, Joanne did 10 tweets on the subject of getting children reading. Ah, so yes. I thought I might uh, read out some of the ones that I thought were, were interesting and... Right. Um, and see what we think. Uh, number one, read aloud to your children as regularly as you can. Yes, which double thumbs up for me. Seems pretty obvious, doesn't yeah. it? But um, it's so easy to let that slide. But 
if you make it part of your routine. Yeah, and I think also it's such a special time in the day. You know, we're so flat out and we're mm. kind of rushing here and there. It's sometimes just the one little moment in a day where it's just you and the child. Yep. And so it's so memorable that, mm. that time for the child and so yep. important, not just for the reading, but for the connection. Yeah. So yeah, double thumbs up from me. Double thumbs up, excellent. Yeah. Uh, another one, let them see you reading for pleasure. Yeah, especially blokes. Especially really dads, important. rad dads read, yeah. which is what I'm, what I go on about. Yes. Um, yeah, kids need to see their dads, their parents, mm. but also specifically their dads, because oftentimes, and, and I know we're changing and we're evolving all the time, but oftentimes dads can fall beside the fall by the wayside a little bit with that sort of thing. Yeah, and even just in a lot of things that involve education, you know, not always, but it will often be the mother that is mm. doing the reader or the communication with the school. And so that can mean to a child that they mm. associate reading or mm. education as a feminine domain, mm. which then can sometimes be problematic for boys. But if they see, and that's why I think it's really great to see photographs of, um, you know, soccer players and footy yeah. stars and red dads like yourself reading <laughs> yes. so that they can see it's, a, you know, it's something that men do as well. Absolutely. And, and that's great role, role modeling. It yeah. is, for sure. The other thing about that is that um, it gives you an excuse to actually read those books that you've been trying to read. So, so you're not neglecting your kids. Yeah. You're doing good role modelling in the yeah. corner. Yeah, you know? absolutely. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's right. So I think it allows you to have a bit of me time, which yeah. I like too. Better behind a book cover than on your phone, right? <laughs> True, exactly. Yeah. Uh, talk about the stories you enjoy. Mm, good idea. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Make it a pleasure, obviously. Yeah. Uh, never criticise your child's choice of reading material. Yeah, it's a that's tricky, a big one, isn't it? I think it is a big one, and it is a really tricky one. I remember my two older boys were very good readers, and we had a little ritual where once a week they would do their taekwondo lesson, and we got to the local bookstore, yep. and they could choose a book each, and then I would choose a book for them, and they would often choose movie spin-offs or you know Minecraft or Lego or whatever because yeah. yeah. they were little, and that's yeah. what they were drawn to. Yeah. And then I would choose the one that I wanted them to read. <laughs> but they'd often end up enjoying them equally. And yes. I think that was important for me to uh, acknowledge that they yeah. need to develop their own taste and their yeah. own interests as well. Exactly. And reading's reading. It's better that they're yeah. reading something rather yeah. than nothing. Absolutely. And you never know, once you start with one book, it could lead to others anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, reading's reading in my book. Um, never use phrases like the classics or quality fiction. That oh probably... gosh, I almost just did that. Just now. <laughs> well, that probably um, relates to the, the last one a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it's true actually. No, don't be literary snobs about kids and what they're yeah. reading. And I feel like I'm learning that more and more, particularly with my third child mm. who struggles with reading, is mm. really developing an idea of what it is that kids are into. It doesn't necessarily have to be what I would have liked them to read. Yeah. You know, it is that thing about I mentioned in the last episode how he used to read a lot of manga yeah. um, so and I really have a lot of respect for authors that um, play around with visuals and comic style as yeah. well to draw on all kinds of readers so yeah don't be a snob <laughs> don't be a snob yeah <laughs> good advice uh, and the last thing I wanted to pull out from uh, Joanne Harris's 10 tweets on getting children reading uh, if your child is a reluctant reader try reading them the start of a really exciting book and then being called away that's really cute. That's I a like cool that. idea, isn't it? That's a great idea. Wait, 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 Dad, finish, finish. <laughs> Next. That's why, that's why a lot of writers end on cliffhangers. Yes. At the end of a chapter. Yep. So the kids just bust in to, yep. to find out what happens next. Absolutely. So cute. I, I like, like that it. Idea. Yeah. Leave them wanting more and they might delve into it themselves. Okay, that was Social Media Watch. But now it's time for this. Our special guest. Special guest time. Felice Arena. Yeah, fabulous writer. Yes. A lot of fun. Really nice guy too. He's a great guy and yep. uh, we're going to be talking to him. I'm, I went out and had a chat with him. Uh, and as we said before, he's known for so many books. Yep. He's got so many different like funny books, yep. um, sporty books, Becky McGee. Um, and now he's delved into the world of historical fiction yeah, for kids. Be, yeah, I'm really looking forward to reading them. Yeah. yeah, and he's done a great job and I'm going to have a bit of a chat with him and find out all about it. So here is Felice Arena. Okay, Felice, we've got our coffees now. I've Thank always you. wondered this. Mm -hmm. When you get a coffee, right? like at, you're at a takeaway joint, something yeah. like that, do you say, what name do you give? Because <laughs> Felice I is used to a pretty tricky one to Felice, 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 no, I actually, Felix is the English version. Oh, is it and Felix? I have, I have a few people who call me Felix. Felix is a very popular name. And I probably should have gone with Felix as I was growing up, but yeah. um, I didn't because of Felix the cat. The wonderful, Felix? wonderful cat. 
and he wasn't kind of cool, but he's kind of cool now. He's so cool. I don't actually don't mind Felix. So I use Felix. That's my Starbucks name. <laughs> I like to call it Felix. But I just, I had a coffee before you got here, yeah. and I, I gave Felix, <laughs> and they wrote down, true, true story. They wrote down fillet. <laughs> fillet, <laughs> as in fillet of fish. Flat white for fillet. <laughs> Is Phil uh, here? That's me. <laughs> Phil oh, well. Arena. It is a pleasure to have you talking to us on the Kidlit Club, Thank you. Uh, Fillet. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Adrian. I'd like to find out a little bit more about Fillet, your career. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, just a bit that, of a chat career. about where it all came from. Now, I noticed you've got a few books here, and I bought a few along as well. Just um, a few. This now, is not all of them, but yeah, no, a few over the years. How many would you have written over the years? You know, I've lost. I've lost count because hmm? there are a few series uh, over look over 50 or so over 50 but I started writing out middle grade fiction and it's actually marked 23 years ago 25 years ago 25 I started years ago 25, 25 when I was only 10 <laughs> when I was only 10 years old I yeah. started writing this um, so what is this one this is this was dolphin a, I was living in the UK right so mid 90s was this, UK, um, was, was this before or after the stint on Neighbours? Was just after. Just after. And I was over there on the back of that. Okay. Doing the whole Riding the theme, wave of doing, success. Actually, I was very, very fortunate. I went straight into a West End show. I didn't Did know you? anyone. I didn't even have a manager. But in the middle of all that, I was doing a teaching course, a primary teaching course. So really? I was qualified in the UK? From, no, here. You did that while you were on Neighbours? While I was auditioning for other shows and then I got Neighbours. Right. I was a primary school teacher. Oh, so how long were you a primary school teacher? Oh, you were, you were training to be one? No, no. I you were, you yeah. were a primary school teacher? Yeah. I'm finding out things that I didn't know about you, Fletcher. I was like a, an expose. I was a, for a year. I was a primary school were teacher. Were you? Yeah, I was. And what, how did you find Not, that? I was an emergency teacher. So I was, emerg I was teaching and I was off to auditions at the same time. You know what? This doesn't come as that much of a, sh a shock to me because I've seen you perform in schools and you, you <laughs> you're, know what? you're brilliant. I, Oh, well, thank, thank you. you. I the, paid them to say that. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> the, the thing is, I, I think I've had teachers come up to me saying, were you a teacher? Teachers can yeah. recognise other teachers. Yes. And I think that teacher training never leaves you. And actually, when I was an actor, oh, when I was an actor in London, a lot of my acting buddies said, where, where did you train back in Australia? NIDA, you know, Whopper, yep. uh, Ramsey Vic Arts, Street. And I said, no, <laughs> Bendigo Teachers College. Ah. <laughs> and you know what? You have to, you have to be... Uh, a jack of all trades as a primary school teacher. Well, there's a de degree of performance involved too. Of course. Yeah. And you know if something's not working with your class, you move on to the next yep. thing. And it was the best, best training. And it still is for me today when I, when I do my school gigs. Yeah. I tap into all that. And of, of, course, of course my acting days, it, yeah. feeds, it still feeds that performance side of me. So you've got the teaching stuff, you've got the performance yep. stuff, and yeah. you bring it all together as a presentation. Yeah. But how did, when you're in the UK, and you were you were doing all your acting gigs over there. How yeah. did you then sort of dovetail see, into writing kind of kids' a, books? It was kind of, I kept it to like myself. this one, 25 years, 25 years. Or was it that one? It was this one. Uh, see, it was kind of a private thing. It was one of those things where you you know you expose yourself as a writer. I mean, you get to show your true self as yeah. an actor. You, you're someone else. That's right. But as a writer, yeah, it's it's very intimate. Get to see you, yeah, yeah. it's in, it is intimate. So I would do that writing on my own in my dressing room behind the scenes. Really? And then there was one moment when I was performing, I was performing in this show called What A Feeling at the London Palladium. Mm. So there I was, it was, a, it was a whole new life. Behind the scenes I was writing these stories and, and, and writing stories about when I was a kid growing up in country Australia. And so the acting sort of, sort of, I thought, well this is the direction I think I might want to go. Mm. The acting was there, but now I had something else I had fallen yeah. in love with. Yeah. And, um, and then 24 years later, here he is. <laughs> I find myself. But a big chunk of that, 24, 24 years, it didn't get going for me. And this is what I've got to mention. It didn't really get going. Books didn't really get going for me. I mean, I had written three of, a couple more after this yeah. until Specky McGee came around. Yeah. And they were all middle grade novels. Yeah. And, um, and then I came home and Specky and football, it was linked to my growing up again and there was nothing really like that. It was the sort of book I would have read as a kid. Um, so were you inspired uh, to come up with the specky idea when you were in the UK? I was, was in the UK and actually yes. I, I, because I was missing home. If I wasn't right. missing home, I don't think, and I was missing things like just showing up yeah. at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a game, and just yeah. you know, a country game yeah, where yeah. you just show up and just sit on the, on the bonnet of a car and watch the yeah. watch footy. I, I was missing little things like that. Mm. And I wonder if I had stayed on here. Whether you would have written it? Yeah. yeah. But it was a big chunk. So 2002 to 2011. Yeah. There was always one book. I, there were eight books in that, that, that period. Yeah. I always wanted one more. And yeah. it still could be. I, there was always one more. 
that I wanted to finish off with Specky and we just didn't get around to it and yeah. schedules it was amazing that Gary was available to do that and he grew in that as well yes. as a writer he followed my lead yep. and his media profile grew during that time it too. did but what I wanted to ask you yeah. and I know you've got all these amazing uh, this amazing new direction that you've taken in recent years but before we move on to that Specky McGee when was the moment that you noticed that this was something massive that uh, you actually thought, you took a step back and you thought, wow, this is, this is a, quite a moment. Uh, it ended up, it was in the, I saw it in the first, first time I'd ever seen a bestsellers list. And it was yeah. in the, like with other, with books, but adult, books for adults. Right. And it was the only children's book in it. Among yep. it. Wow. And I went, okay. And it was, and the publishers were caught out at the time. They didn't have enough print run. Really? Yeah. So they had to do that a was reprint. A little, <laughs> scary, quickly. Yeah. And I noticed that at schools and letters, letters back then, yeah. Sent to me from teachers saying, "This is great for those boys who don't normally pick up books." Yep. And, and that was the, that happened at the first book, the very first book you got that book. feeling. And it just it just grew from there and it snowballed. And then it took it really took a life on its own. I mean, then by the third or fourth book, we would these amazing huge launches. We had a launch at the MCG with yeah. five thousand kids, yeah. and that was just like, oh my! Yeah. It was just it was, it was amazing huge. to it was see that. Massive. But I was just always grateful that it, that happened. Yeah. Um, it sort of gave me a little freedom to be able to do other things and explore other things. Mm. Speaking of which, in recent years, you've moved into more of a historical fiction, or lots of action, lots of suspense, and lots yeah, of adventure. I, yeah, but not, you've taken a bit of a, yeah, I suppose, I, a, a turn left. I was known for writing, and I love writing. And you know me, I'm sort of, yeah. I just sort of am always on the go. You are always on the go. <laughs> But I, and this is really calm for me at the moment. It is, yeah. I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to be all very calm. But um, obviously, what I'm talking about is The Boy and the Spy kicked it all off, uh, then Fearless Frederick, yeah. and the latest one, A Great Escape. So yeah. yeah, what I want to know is, what inspired you to take, I mean, from footy to historical fiction, it's quite a leap. What's, what, what happened? <laughs> what happened was I, I went back to my first love of writing that for that age group, middle yeah. grade middle grade age group and I love and I have written for a younger a younger uh, yes. audience you know with my sporty kids, kids series, and, Andy and Roy I love and, that yep. and I'm doing another junior series but yep. um, I went back to that I love the fact that we it's okay to write drama for kids and I've written humor before and I've written adventure but drama and reality and and, and dramatic adventure when I was a kid I loved Colin Teal yes. I loved, now it's funny we have Storm Boy, Storm Boy out again yep. but Storm Boy was a real turning book for me. Yes. Uh, I loved Bluefin, I love Colin Teal stories, I love Gary Polson. These sort of old fashioned rollicking but realistic adventures. And I've got to be really honest and we've talked about this. You've got to go back to what you lose yourself in and what you love to write. Well some it's, people wouldn't realise this but you are a, a massive traveller. You I love do, I love to travel. Traveling. I love meeting other people and meeting and, and immersing myself in other cultures yeah so I wanted to bring that in that, and that's why it's no surprise to me who knows you that you wanted to feature all these different uh, cu uh, cultures and countries in yeah. your writing yeah. which perhaps you didn't get a chance to in some of the books previously no 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 and uh, I, yeah and I love it I, I really do love yeah. it and I mean there's so much there's only so much you can do on Google Word that's what <laughs> I tell myself I really do need to visit Paris yes, that's right <laughs> I have well, to just sit in Paris for example I mean Boy in the Spy <laughs> Set in uh, Sicily, Sicily, uh, and then came Where my mum's from. Fearless Frederick, set in Paris, Paris, as you said, and then the latest one, A Great Escape. Yeah, this is the one. Tell yeah. us about A Great Escape. I mean, now it's starting to look like a series, it's, it's, even it's though they're one-off. They're one-off stories. It definitely one looks off. like they're, they're yeah. all combined, absolutely. And I would love if they, if readers would read all three. Yep. I mean, that's what that's what I'd hope. But they're all one-off uh, standalone novels. Yep. This one, this was the a little tougher. Now, I wasn't really the sure great, if I should. A write Great this. Escape. Uh, it's set. And I'll, I'll explain why. It's set in Berlin. <laughs> I'm glad you did. 19, yeah, I'm going to anyway. <laughs> set in Berlin, 1961. Yep. Uh, is the day. It's set, the story starts on the day the wall goes up, the Berlin Wall. Right. Now, for us, that's probably not considered history. I suppose it's modern history. Mm. But for kids, mm. they're probably hearing about this for the very first time. Yep. It's the anniversary of when the wall went down this year. Okay. 30 years ago. Yeah, wow. Right. 30 years ago. And I remember watching it on the so news. So I actually. And it was a huge event, yep. right around the world. Everyone was watching when that wall went down. It was incredible, yeah. And I was in Berlin. I, my neighbours, when I, I lived in St Kilda, my neighbours were from Berlin. Yep. And I got to know a lot about Berlin. And then I went to visit them back in 2013. Wrote, and I'm always, when I travel, I always bring uh, notepads with me and 
and jot down ideas and stuff. And I had some ideas then. And after Phyllis Frederick, I wasn't sure should I do another historical uh, uh, novel. And, but I was having so much fun down this path. I thought, yeah, perhaps. And I went back to that notebook and I went, oh, Berlin Wall. But you know what? So much has been written on the Berlin Wall. And it's political. And how do you, how do you bring that to a level accessible for kids, yeah. the age group I'm writing for? But then the voice, I always talk about these voices. I know it's, it's almost like I'm possessed, huh? <laughs> the voices. voice of this boy yep. in East Berlin. And I was there and I, in 2000, well, 2012, 2013, yep. and looking at my notes. And the boy, you know, a lot of families were separated when that wall went up. Well, actually, it was just a barbed wire. It was called Barbed Wire Sunday, 1961 in August. And the barbed wire went up right through the middle of the city, cut right through the middle of the city, as we all know. East, West, and every, there were so thousands of families separated. And mm. again, I always go back to what if, mm. what if that happened to me or you, yeah. if you were separated from your wife and kids, yeah. what would you do? Mm. You would do anything to get to them, course, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. And that instantly that sets the jeopardy up. And so I started doing a little research, got online, yeah. hearing, and because it's modern history, people are still alive mm. who lived through that. Yeah. Which makes it a little easier. A little easier, yeah. and 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 real. Yeah. Because you know Paris was 1910. Everyone's passed away in the yeah. World War. Most of the veterans have gone. Mm. So, but this, they're still around. So yeah. I, I got to hear their stories, listen to their stories, talk to my friends in Germany as well, and thought, could I do this? And I really, really wasn't sure until I live in Melbourne in the city in an apartment. My neighbour next door, mm. only two doors down. Walks his dog, he's a man in his 70s. Uh, walks his Labrador called Otto, and he's German. He has a German accent, and he said, Felix, he calls me Felix, not Felice. He calls me the English or the German version of Felice. Yes. Felix, uh, what are you writing now? And I said, uh, I said, Peter, I said, um, there's, well, I'm thinking of writing something set in Berlin. Well, you know, I'm from Berlin. Oh, you are? And I said, he said, what, what are you going to write? And I said, I'm thinking about around the time of the Berlin Wall when the wall goes up and a boy is separated from his family and he's desperate to get over or around that wall to get back to his family, mm. escape the east mm. to get to the west. And he said, oh, well, you know what, I, I lived then, there at that time. And I said, oh, okay. And he said, you know what I did? I was a guard on the wall. Wow. And you're like, this is oh, perfect. Okay. <laughs> this has to be written. I think I have to do this. Yeah. And can, can He's I? He's lived two doors down from me. Yeah. So I've been able to draw on his experience and, and ask his him things. Peter. Peter. So I named the character after him, Peter. Yeah, so the, the lead character in the book. Peter. 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 That's great. Okay, so Great Escape is all yeah. about now. What is coming up? You know, I know Great Escape is probably yeah. going to take up most of your year talking about that in schools and all the rest yeah, of it. Yeah, I'm booked but in schools. Are there yeah. other things that you can uh, sort of give us a little bit of an insight into what's happening? Well, now what's I, in the pipeline? Well, you know, you, you always want to evolve and you want to try something new and, yep. and, and, and how do you keep it fresh? Yep. I, look, I have another idea for an historical action adventure, go, maybe yeah. closer to home. Ooh. I'm still sort of feeling Scoop. my way through and I'm still waiting for that voice to come to me. Yes. I'm not going to just do it because, oh well, now I'm on a, I've yeah. created something, let's yeah. just do it. You need that moment of inspiration. I still do. Mm. I, I think I do and I, I think, think I've been fair. doing it for so long, you yeah. do. What I kind of like about um, some of the things that I know, I've got an inside word on what's coming up for you, is that you've almost come full circle in some ways because The Boy and the Spy oh, yeah. has Look, really taken off in terms I of love, theatre productions. Yeah, I uh, last year the International School of Geneva read the book, yep. they loved it, they said could we do a play version with yeah. our drama students, yeah. year 11. I said, there isn't a play, what well, could you write as a play? Okay. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> But I said yes, but I hadn't realised it was at the time that we were going to work so quickly on it. I said, right, we've got you scheduled in for 2017. Yep. Well, that was like, that was 2018. I said, oh, and this is back in 2017. So on the back of this, and it was still fresh in my mind, the story, I wrote the play. And it felt like I had gone full circle, starting off as an actor, teacher, teacher, mm. actor, mm. writer, back to yeah. putting all those elements together and doing what I love and being in front of young audiences and this was such an amazing experience. So I went over there for a month. They staged the show. Now I brought the template back. I know. And Aussie and schools are able to. Yeah, Aussie okay. schools. But I have a school in Scotland, a school in America wow. at the moment, and a school in Rome. Who right. have come forward and said, this could be great for our secondary students. So if you're a secondary school teacher and you're thinking you want something new, mm. 
and exciting that would appeal to young audience like a junior audience yep. plus your yep. secondary students yep. and then it could be the boy and the spy the so spy. you can go to the boy and the spy .com if you're interested in staging it at your school and then they you know they could they could tie it in they could tie it in with the books and read the yep. book and then and see the, see the show as well Perfect. the yeah. whole package just like Felice Arena the whole package <laughs> Thank you so much for having Thank a chat. You, um, Thank you. I, I this probably, has been really good. I, I probably need our, to have another coffee. Yeah. Uh, is, it, is it your shout or? Yes, my shout. My <laughs> shout. My shout. Gussel. <laughs> Thank you, Gussel. Felice. Or should I say, thank you, Philip. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to Felice for having that chat. And it was yep. great to catch up with Felice. And his current book is A Great Escape which uh, is, what a great cover too. It's, it's fantastic and I hope you check that out and uh, enjoy that one, A Great Escape There by Felice Arena. Okay, we've come to the end of another episode. Sal. Sadly. I don't know where the time goes. <laughs> <laughs> I have to wait another whole two weeks. That's to right. Chat with you again, Adrian. It's going to help me. Yeah, you'll get through. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, thank you very much to Felice. Thank you for another outstanding Rip and Report. And uh, may your footy team win. Yeah, yeah, go <laughs> whoever's losing. <laughs> yes, go whoever's losing. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Uh, goodbye.